Well, welcome to our next installment of our QC Conversations. If you're new to the Questioning Christianity channel, my name is Dan Patterson, and our heartbeat here is to help you connect the Christian story to life's deepest questions. Uh, these long-form conversations are a chance to get an expert in their field on the channel to really throw them all the difficult questions and have them sit in the proverbial hot seat. So thank you for all the questions that you send in through our website at questioningchristianity.com or through our social media accounts to try and have your questions answered. This is the opportunity to do it. And today you're in for a treat because we are diving into all things Book of Revelation. This is a little bit the deep end and the interesting angle when it comes to reading different books of the Bible and to be able to help make sense of the images and the numbers and all of the end times questions that people have. Uh, we're bringing on a good friend, uh, Reverend Dr. Ian Paul, all the way from the UK. Ian, it's great to have you on. Diana, it's really good to be with you. I'm, I'm really pleased to join you in sunny Australia. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, technically, I'm in the future. I may look darker here because it's nighttime, but obviously you have the joys of being in a nice and chirpy in the morning. So you've probably had your Absolutely. coffee and I've already had my warm milk before bedtime. So uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have indeed. a great time. Perfect. Uh, well, we're going to be chatting today about the book of Revelation, which is a really interesting part of the Bible as a whole. But before we dive in there uh, to tackle such a complex set of tricky questions, uh, maybe we'll do a bit of introduction. Uh, I first came across your work actually reading your blog, which has been enormously mm. popular in the Christian world. How do you pronounce it for those non-Greek speaking uh, people who are <laughs> looking at it going, Sophizo, how do we do that? What does that mean? Tell us the well, name. I yeah, I call it Sifidzo, but then actually I was recently in a conference with a with a native Greek speaker, and she said, "No, no, 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 it's Sifidzo." <laughs> uh, okay. So even I, even I, even I get it wrong. But I mean, yeah. uh, the, 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 the you can the claim that you're doing Koine ancient Greek and different to exactly, modern. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Totally. So, yeah, yeah. But, but the, can the, you introduce the a little bit style. to your story and to yeah. your work? Yeah. Well, it's really interesting because um, I the, the 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 word Sifidzo in Greek means two things. It means to uh, calculate or to vote. And the reason is it's related to the noun cephos, which means a okay. pebble. And in the ancient world, you'd use your, well, you'd use pebbles and you'd, or you'd use your fingers to count. You know, in the ancient world, um, doing maths is really about the real world. It's about tangible things. It's about, you know, reorganizing stuff. Um, but you'd, you'd also use a pebble to vote for people. So typically in an election, you'd have two jars and you'd have a black pebble and a white pebble and you'd drop your pebble into the right jar to vote for the right person. Oh. So um, I suppose on the blog, I talk about the fact that um, the, the, the Christian faith is, on the one hand, is something that adds up. It makes sense. So there's a rational in integrity to Christian faith. So that's one meaning of the word. But on the other hand, Christian faith also, when you've done the hard work and you've done the thinking, you actually need to make a decision. You actually need to vote <laughs> with, your, with your feet, with your life, you know, and, uh, and say, well, are the claims that this person Jesus makes, do they stack up? And am I am I going to commit to follow him? So uh, so, and those two things kind of relate to my own my own story a little bit as well. Yeah, well, could you spell that out just a couple of minutes, maybe briefly, yeah. for our listeners yeah. to hear a bit more of your story? Well, I was brought up a, ch a church going. Uh, my mother was an Irish Catholic. Uh, she came over to the UK after the Second World War and sort of settled here. And, and she had to. She was as a migrant. She actually, actually had to, had to really shed her accent and shed our identity because being irish in london after the war wasn't a very popular thing you know you hear sure. stories about people having signs up on on um, accommodation saying no dogs no blacks no irish so she actually changed her name so she sounded less irish and she dropped her accent but she continued to be church going a roman catholic and so i was brought up in in that sort of church going tradition and um I, I didn't find that going to church really connected with the questions that I was asking. I was I was in a, a, a an all boys boarding school, a, a, a public school in London. Uh, it had some boarders. I was a day boy, and it was a pretty competitive environment. It was pretty tough, and I felt I wasn't competing very well. I I, sent, I could see looking back quite a strong sense of insecurity, and and I found that just going to church wasn't really connecting with the the big questions in life that I had. And in fact, through a series of what looked like at the time coincidences, I ended up meeting a group of Christians at a different church where for them, I, I, when I met them, I thought, there's something different here. You know, actually faith means something to them. Faith answers their questions. Faith is real for them. And so over a period of about nine months, I actually, through exploring and joining their group, I came to, uh, faith came alive for me personally. Mm. And what was really one of the really interesting things was that I only realized in retrospect, um, one of the things that I'd done in school, as many boys do, is I used to swear a lot. And that was a way of getting attention and, you know, being cool or whatever. 
uh, after I came to faith, I, I suddenly looked back and I realized I'd stopped swearing because I didn't mm. need to. It wasn't so anyone told me not to do it. It was just one of those behaviors which was a response to my own feelings of insecurity. And as I found security in discovering the love of God, then uh, all that fell away. And, and curiously, again, there's two issues on my blog about making sense on the one hand and actually about um, uh, responding on the other. Uh, a few years later, I had to give my, my testimony in a, a mission week that I was helping on. And I'd always thought that I came to faith because it was rational, it made sense. And then I realized as I reflected, actually, it was also the emotional reality of faith that actually made the difference for me. So I think my life has always been the, those two things, really, my, my Christian walk is working things out, you know, thinking about things, but actually responding with the heart and, and allowing, allowing the love of God in Jesus actually to change who you are emotionally mm -hmm. and in your secure, level of security as well. Oh, it's really helpful uh, and useful way, I think, of like breaking down the two elements of it, the making sense mm -hmm. of and then the so what. Uh, and that's probably a little bit what we're hopefully going to be doing tonight. Uh, I've got a yeah. ton of mates that aren't Christians that didn't grow up going to church at all. Yeah. And when it comes to the book of Revelation, it would be completely unfamiliar. So say one of them stumbles on, watches this video and thinks, all right, what's this whole book of Revelation about? And why on earth should I care what it says? What would you say? Well, uh, there's some practical reasons why you should care. One is that I think the book of Revelation has, has got a good claim to, see, to say it's the, it's, the, it's the text which has influenced Western geopolitics more than any other. Hmm. Uh, if you take the, I mean, in all sorts of ways, I mean, it's all, all through history. For, just for example, in the year 1000, there was a, a crisis because of the, the language of the millennium in Revelation 20. And uh, in Europe, everyone thought the world was going to come to an end. And one of the responses to that was um, the first peace conferences. So in France, um, the whole population of an area would gather in a field and they'd have a peace conference about saying how could they live well together as they face this crisis. Um, mm. The book of Revelation has shaped Christian art and worship more than any other. I, I generally reckon if you go into a, a church with stained glass windows, you look at collections of Christian art, you will find images from the book of Revelation probably in about 50% of the pictures there, on the, the stained glass there, wow. in Christian worship. Every time you use the word hallelujah, or every time you mention the lamb on the throne, every time you mention the alpha and the omega, those are only those terms only occur in the book of Revelation. So if you think that the Christian faith has influenced uh, um, global culture or Western culture particularly, then the book of Revelation has got you know front and center's place on that. Um, I'd say there's another there's another whole area where um, the book of Revelation you need to attend to it regardless of your faith position. Um, uh, and that is that it's the most remarkable piece of human literature ever written. The complexity, the structure, the way it integrates. We'll, we'll explore some of these, no doubt. The way it integrates Old Testament ideas, its numerical structure, its literary qualities are really extraordinary. But there's also an existential element to this as well. And that is that, you know, the word apocalypse has come into common parlance. You know, people talking about, oh, the situation is really apocalyptic. Or I heard on the news yesterday, I said, this is really like Armageddon. And and uh, so one of the things that I've been acutely aware of is that uh, to be human is to actually have an apocalyptic outlook on the world. Um, if, if you look, look at the news now, but if you look 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 100 years ago, 300 years ago, 1,000 years ago, you will find on the one hand the idea that we're progressing, that humanity is better than it's ever been before. Alongside that, you'll also find the idea that we are facing an imminent crisis. We're on the edge of a precipice. Everything is about to go terribly wrong. Yeah, wow. And that, that, you know, the language we find in the contemporary world, you need to put that in historical context. Every generation of, of humanity has always thought that they're on the brink of a precipice. So actually, on the one hand, to be hopeful, but on the, on the, on the other hand, to feel apocalyptic is just the mark mm. of, of humanity. So interesting. There's so many dimensions that we're uh, hopefully going to be able to draw out from that, but, but worth reading at least. Uh, now, no doubt people will find it confusing and maybe that contributes a little bit. We decided to maybe cheekily uh, title this episode with you, uh, Is Revelation Left Behind? Uh, no mm. doubt that will strike some cultural yeah. comments uh, in terms of your experience. But historically speaking, this book, which is in where it's ordered the last book of the Bible, the collection yeah. of 66 books, yeah. nearly got left out of the canon, it seems. 
names, uh, at yeah. least when Eusebius, the early church historian, is describing which mm. books do we have as being unanimously in, which books mm. are somewhat mm. questionable or perhaps out. Uh, the book of Revelation found itself in both of those lists. Uh, mm. And certainly people in church history like Martin Luther somewhat found it to have some questionable status yep. at a certain part of his faith as well. Why do you think uh, it's had that questionable heritage as whether or not it should be part of Christian scripture? Well, it's actually had a slightly more complex history than that. Michael Kruger, who's written the book Question of Canon, uh, he's an American scholar, um, he actually traces this really well. And the, the history of Revelation in the canon is more complicated. Everything about Revelation is more complicated than you think. <laughs> I, I, um, because I'm half Irish, my, my grandfather actually was a member of the IRA in the 1920 uprising and so on. So um, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in the history of the Troubles. And somebody, somebody mm -hmm. about the Troubles in Northern Ireland once said, I have to be sure, if you're not confused, you don't really know what's going on. And that's really true about the book of Revelation. So okay. Everything about it is confusing. Um, yeah. And the question of canon on, on Revelation is also confusing in that actually Michael Kruger traces the way that when you look at the patristic, early patristic quotation citations of it, it looks like Revelation actually came into the canon very quickly and very confidently. And then towards the end of the second century into the third century, actually it then fell out of uh, favor. And the reason for that was primarily around the movement called Montanism after Montanus, or, or called the New Prophecy, where Revelation excited um, a very, well, an, an apocalyptic outlook, a millenarian outlook, and, and where people were thinking literally the, the end is at hand. And even the, the Montanists actually even identified the mountain in Phrygia where the New Jerusalem was going to come down. And a number of the fathers thought that was a bad idea. Augustine thought that was a very bad idea. And that's what then pushed Revelation to the margins. And what's, what's fascinating for me is that that is absolutely archetypal of the way that people respond to Revelation generally. So on the one yeah. hand, people sometimes say, yeah, this is profound. This is theological. I would argue that it's the most Trinitarian book in the New Testament. Uh, I, I'd say it gives us a worked example of how you enculturate the gospel in an alien culture more than any, more than Paul's letters, certainly more than the gospels. So it's it's on the one hand, it's really valuable and really important. But then you get the lunatic fringe, you get hold <laughs> get hold of it and say, oh, it's all about barcodes, or it's all about uh, the COVID vaccine. So you know the end of the world is coming here, and everyone goes, hang on a second, you guys are crazy, and and because you're basing your ideas on this book, maybe this book is crazy, and we ought to ignore it. So yeah. that is why I think the Book of Revelation is often left behind, but. I, I've, I've, I would argue, and I do say to people, that I think one of the reasons why the church in the West has been ravaged by the, the rapid changes in culture in the last 30 years and why um, the, the, the changes we've seen, the sort of what, what people have called uh, effective individualism, the sort of inward turn for self-discovery and so on, um, and the whole complexity of things around how the internet has, has, has affected and, and shaped our culture, and it's really corroded the idea of discipleship. And I think one of the reasons for that, one of the reasons we felt so so unable to respond to that is we haven't paid attention to the book of Revelation. We, ha we haven't looked at this worked example of what it means to be living counterculturally in an alien culture, which is, I think, what, what Revelation is doing. So it, yeah. it, it has been left behind, but it's, it's a book that we really need to recover as a church. Yeah, that's a really helpful. And I'll even just love that idea, the, the revelation of Jesus Christ that comes into the midst of the situations that Christians are facing. And uh, chapters two and three for, for newcomers have this real historical element to it, particularly because they record a series of report cards for better or worse letters uh, that yeah. were written from Jesus effectively. Not, to not, not the letters, actually. They're not, they're not okay. seven, letters, seven churches. So it's one letter to all the churches. Well, well, what the, you, you immediately start getting into some of the challenges here in Revelation. So, first of all, yeah. the whole of the Book of Revelation is cast as a letter. So you have your letter type beginnings. At the, so in, yeah. in verse four, where John says, "Right, down John, what you've seen, seen. Yeah. exactly parallel to what Paul writes," and you have an, a letter ending, epistolary ending as well. So the whole thing is a prophetic, apocalyptic letter. In the in chapters two and three, these look much more like royal pronouncements from the king or the emperor. But just by the way, of course, in Greek, the word king and the word emperor are the same word. So we, yeah. you know, we should distinguish between those two. Um, and, and they're not messages to churches. Because um, I, when I was in theological college, I was teaching in a seminary. I, I always prohibited the students from ever using the word church. Because the, the word church, in our mind, means a building, an institution, an organization. And, of course, here, the word ecclesia is actually meaning the followers of Jesus gathered together in a city. So, mm -hmm. so church is always about people not about institutions yeah. so yeah but apart from that yes 
<laughs> Sorry, <Tom's laughs> <doing that. laughs> that's so helpful. It's, it's a perfect example of the everything's more complicated than than uh, what you're about to absolutely. say. So please do. That's great. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah. maybe nearly a decade ago now, my wife Erin and I and another couple of friends of ours had the opportunity to land in Izmir in Turkey, which is ancient mm. day Smyrna, and then to actually mm, drive yeah. around Syrica and drive around to the various ruins from these seven historical cities, which most of them now are exactly that, just mm. a pile of rubble. Uh, yeah. But it was a wonderful opportunity to try and take stock of these royal pronouncements that are made publicly mm. for the years of all uh, who are going to mm. receive this cyclical mm. letter. Um, what would you say is the message of Book Revelation for the church today in light of that? And, and imagine you're sitting over there in the UK and you're picturing, all right, so we've got letters from Jesus' pronouncements uh, to all these ancient churches. Mm. If he was to ask John to pick up a pen today and to write mm. a letter to the church, what do you think he might say? Wow. Okay, Dan, you're asking me. Yes, okay. You're asking me to pronounce Jesus' words to the church in the West. That's quite an ask. <laughs> um, you can, can I just provide back? a disclaimer if you'd like. Uh, well, I want to wind back a little bit and say, and again, it all gets more complex, that, that in, there's a sense in which these royal pronouncements speak to us in at, at least three different levels. So, and most people only go to one level. They go straight to the content and say, oh, okay, so in Ephesus says you've lost your first love. Well, we've lost our first love. We need to recover that. Or, you know, you, you, you're lukewarm and we're lukewarm and, uh, and so on. So that was actually, that was when I, first came, when I first came to faith. I was not only going to church in the Roman Catholic church and I was attending a, a youth group in an Anglican church. I was also going to a Baptist church Bible study. And, and lo and behold, we were reading the book of Revelation. That's where I first came yeah. across it. And uh, we got to the letter of Laodicea, to the message, the royal pronouncement to the people of God in Laodicea. And, uh, you know, we got to this thing about lukewarm and the Baptist all went, yeah, lukewarm, lukewarm church. You know, the seven churches, that's the seven ages of the church. That's, so this is speaking to us now. Look at those Anglicans. They're all lukewarm, aren't they? How prophetic. <laughs> and I sat there quietly going, whoa. <laughs> but the, the first thing that actually this um, these messages remind us of is that the, the book, like all of Scripture, Revelation is not written to us even if it is written for us. And one of the great mistakes that, that people make in reading the book of Revelation is some, somehow or other, you know, when they, when, they read, when they read 1 Corinthians, they don't think Paul is writing to us now. They think Paul is writing to the Corinthians in the first century. So we have to go on this slightly indirect route and say, well, if Paul was saying this to the Corinthians then, what is God saying to us now through that? So we have to do that. And even ordinary readers of the Bible will do that. And they'll be aware of that. Yeah. And they'll say, well, okay, well, Paul's talking about food offered to idols. What does that mean for them? And what situation might be a parallel analogous one for us now? And then suddenly we turn to the book of Revelation, we throw our brains out the window and go, oh, this is to us now. And of course, it clearly isn't. John is one of the, 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 the first message that, that these royal pronouncements say is that John is passing on to particular people in particular time, particular place, the words of Jesus to them now. So yes, we can learn from that, but we need to do the same things we do in reading Corinthians. So that's the first way, the first mm -hmm. level, as it were, that that does. Yeah. The second thing which is really interesting is that, of course, he chooses to write, or he's told to write seven messages to seven places. We know perfectly well there are other churches around. There are other, there are other communities yeah. of faith there. There was Colossae, there was Miletus, there was Troas, and so on. So already... Um, what John is saying to us is is that this is not just this is not just a message for these particular people, but it is a message for everybody because seven is the number of completion. So, and they are they are. And this is the embarrassing thing. They're reading each other's mail. They're they're, yeah. they're <laughs> the, the, the dirty linen is being hung out, hung out in public so that we can. Their read. iPhone has been opened for everyone to read all the messages. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so so that that's that's pretty striking as well. And then at the third level, we say, okay, what's the content here, and what are the, what are the things that apply to us? But what's fascinating as well is that. Um, the message of the gospel is coming to each person in each each situation in ways that relate to them. So you have this multidimensional image of Jesus in chapter one, but that image, part, uh, parts of that image apply in different ways and with a different kind of bite depending on the situation they're in. So sometimes when teaching through this, one of the things I've done is to say, well, well, how do, how does your how does your church community how does it reflect your culture? in good ways and in bad ways. I used to live in Poole in Dorset, and one of the big mm. businesses there is tourism. And, you know, people used to say, hey, your church is really welcoming. 
and we'd say, well, okay, our church warden runs a bed and breakfast and welcomes people all the time. So maybe that's that's you know that's not so surprising. But yeah. the, but also when we we're trying to introduce change to things, then it was actually uh, actually change was slow because it was sleepy Dorset. You know, we weren't used to changing, not like those people, wild people in London. So so there's a paradigm there of saying, well, how does the gospel bite for us? So rather than I think the, your, your question is a good one, saying, okay, in the West. What is Jesus saying to the church? Well, actually, in different contexts and different places, um, Jesus is going to be saying different things, and different aspects of who Jesus is are going to be relevant to us in in different ways. So, so this whole pattern opens up a complexity of questions, and and I think the the big question is, how do we relate to our culture? Where where does the gospel bite and conflict in our culture? And obviously, the whole debate about we're having about sexuality is a key issue. Because scripture offers us a fundamentally different anthropology, a different understanding of what it means to be human made in the image of God than the, than the, uh, uh, than the assumptions we have in the culture around us. Uh, and that's, that's particularly, you know, but having a bite at, at, at this moment. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, you've spoken a little bit like the, the numbers and the complexity of even understanding the imagery and multidimensional yep. visions of Jesus. And I think that's the thing that strikes a lot of people the first time they read the book of Revelation yep. is just trying to orient themselves what is all of this and and how do i make sense of the genre that we're talking about is it a letter is it a prophecy uh how is this meant to function and then you've got the whole aspect of all right it is full of ideas and images and idioms a lot of which are old testament references you know there's some 800 or so allusions to the old testament if not direct quotations uh a lot of it's first century is that prophecy therefore pointing forwards as well so can you help unpick for a newcomer that's coming to this book what is it in terms of genre and how do you go about making sense of the diverse images other than obviously well, picking up your you, commentary you, you, you on the book of revelation hell. yeah you, and, and i've got a little bit of help here so i've got a commentary <laughs> I've written and uh, i've got behind me as well a, a growth yeah. booklet which is a really a really short way in i mean my growth booklet only takes you sort of an hour and a half to sit down and read and i just actually pick out each of these individual things um one of the things i love about the book of revelation is that i pictured john sitting there and watching us read and he's actually having a little bit of a laugh at our expense because um, on the one hand, yeah, they're asking about different genres is the right question because um, what, oh, and I noticed you're being theological there. I mean, genre is a French word. It makes it sound fancy. I mean, the, in English, we just say kind of writing, but you know, if you're a theologian, you need to make stuff sound complicated just to impress people, you know, so. Um, so, so on the one hand, this is, this is an apocalypse, which means now apocalypse doesn't mean disaster literature, actually, although it does read like disaster literature. It actually means a revelation, an uncovering. Apple mm. means taking off the calypse, the covering. So it is about revealing. And, and it's just worth reminding this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's from him and it's about him. This isn't, this isn't, John doesn't claim he's giving a kind of end times chronological timetable here. He's actually trying to focus us on Jesus, who Jesus is, what it means to follow him. And and this is why I always argue that, that Revelation is the most Christian book in the New Testament, because who is the person who uses the language of apocalypse more than anybody else? The answer is it's Paul. Mm. He says, you know, I receive this as, an, as a revelation, an apocalypse. Jesus to Peter says, you know, when Peter says um, uh, that uh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus says, well, this has been revealed to you because the Christian faith is a revealed faith. You can't work it out for yourself. You can't work out logically that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Somebody has to tell you. Somebody has to reveal it to you. So in that sense, Revelation is the most Christian book. Um, yeah, it's a prophecy. It describes itself as a prophecy. But, but the prophetic isn't primarily about telling the future it's primarily about revealing god's perspective on the present and 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 the reason that's connected with the future is it leads to consequences look you think you're doing this but actually what you're doing is that and if you carry on doing that it's going to lead to this consequence that's what the prophetic is about and it's a, a letter it's written to particular people at a particular time particular place but also it is hymnic there's look there's, there's there's this hymnody there's this breaking off into praise all the time and Re- that's why revelation has shaped christian praise more than any other but the other thing that's really fascinating about it is that these different kinds of writing john just messes us up in the in in, in the in the first chapter you read through and you find he, he starts off apocalyptic then it's blessing then it's letter or oh, then it goes back to apocalyptic or oh, then it goes back to prophetic then it's letter again and it's a little bit like he's john's messing with us and he's saying you think you know what this book is no it's not it's something different you think you understand this no it's not and it's actually he's actually making us sit up and, and think and go what what is going on here 
And uh, and he's even, you know, he even messes with us with all these angels and stuff. I mean, he's like he's in an angelic job creation scheme because an angel comes on and says this, then the angel goes off, we never hear from him again. Another angel comes on, another angel goes off. And, and it's a bit like he's enacting in the text the things he's trying to communicate because twice in two episodes – he says that he, he, he's tempted to bow down and worship the angel. And the angel says, don't do that. I'm just a fellow servant with you. Well, we know that because already these angels have come and gone and they've, they've obviously not been important at all. It's not the angels that matter. What mm -hmm. matters is the message that they bring. So John is constantly focusing us on saying, you know, don't think this is this, this is that. It's not. And don't get obsessed with what this book is. What you need to be obsessed about is who Jesus is and who, what Jesus is telling you and what it means to live as a faithful witness so one of the and again this is why the key to numerology numerology isn't some sort of magic stuff the numerology is there to reinforce the message and the language of faithful witness is, is absolutely classic so jesus is, is described as a faithful witness jesus followers are called to be faithful witnesses to endure and the name jesus occurs 14 times in the text now 14 is two times seven Seven is the number of completeness. Two is the number of witness, because in Deuteronomy 7, it says you must have, do not believe the testimony of one person. You must have two people who testify. So the text tells us, John tells us Jesus is a faithful witness, and then he reinforces that by the name Jesus occurring 14 times, mm. which is the number of faithful witness. That's, yeah. that's why I love this book, because I, I, my first degree was in mathematics, so I love the numbers. <laughs> I did pick that up in your bio. It was something that sort of intrigued me, <laughs> yeah. and particularly then when you think it's not, not just two and seven. Uh, Revelation is full of numbers, numbers like 12 Absolutely. or 12 stars or 10. Yeah. for the king, Yes, yeah, so all yeah. of these different numbers. Numbers. Um, what do you make of all of that? Is there some more light that you can shed on that as a mathematician turned theologian? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, I can. And there's some fantastic connections with contemporary life as well. Um, again, just going back to this is even more complex than you think. John actually uses numbers in four different ways, not just one or two. Um, and obviously the book is, is fairly clearly structured. So we have three sequences. We actually have four sequences. One is hidden from us, but three sequences of seven things. So you have the seven seals unsealed and you have the seven trumpets trumpeted. Um, people talk about blowing the trumpets. Actually, he uses the same verb and noun, their cognitive verb and noun, so that the trumpets are trumpeted and the bowls are poured out. Um, so you get these obvious numbers. And, and of course, there are seven, the seven cities with the, the, the Christian communities in them. So you get that kind of thing. You, you get the the the, the word frequency stuff as well which i talked about so the fact that you get different a, number, a whole range of terms and words occur certain numbers of times and within that john does an amazing thing where when he repeats a phrase a certain number of times so example for example the phrase people from every tribe language people and nation that phrase occurs seven times but every seven, every occurrence of it is different from the other one. So he mixes it up the whole time. When he talks about the elders and the creatures again, that the, he mentions the elders and the creatures around the throne seven times. But every time it's in a different order with a different different structure to it. So so wow. this is a, this is an extraordinarily carefully crafted text, which again is another reason to to, to attend to it because it is it is quite quite extraordinary. How he then also that, uses, how much if I could interject for a sec, how much is that John? Yeah crafting a literary piece or him quite literally just writing down what he was told to write you know your understanding of how he had these visions on the isle of patmos while he's exiled there under the reign of domitian and uh like how 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 do you foresee this happening i was in the spirit on the lord's day and then i saw you know uh what's your sense of that you know is this uh, joe rogan experience on lsd kind of crazy <laughs> visions is he dreaming is this the sky's cracking open and he's seeing real extra mental activity. What do you, what do you picture with this well, sort of thing? I, I, I want to be agnostic about whether John had a vision or not uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that I don't know if you've had any visions. I've a couple of times had visions. And when you have them, it's quite hard to describe what it is you've experienced. I mean, it's hard enough hmm. to even describe when you, you know, when you have a dream and you wake up in the morning, you have a really vivid dream, then you describe yeah. it. And then it's my hard. wife the other day yeah it's hard yeah, it's, it's just hard it's hard to know what it is exactly you're describing i mean it, it, is it like you're actually seeing something in real life or is it something different and and there's a big debate about that just in terms of neuroscience i think the second observation is that we use the language of seeing in all sorts of interesting ways but you might say oh i see what you're saying there or i or i love in the film avatar when they've used this phrase i see you 
yeah. which means I understand you. Okay, so so even that language of the visionary language has all sorts of different meanings for us. But I think the third thing for me, which rather seals the deal in terms of what's going on, is that because this text is so incredibly carefully crafted, whenever we report a vision or a dream, we use our own language. And the language that John is using here is language which ends up being extraordinarily and intricately structured. So I would say in the end, let's not get hung up about whether they had a vision or not. Let's not try to recreate his vision. Yeah. And actually, a lot of his visionary elements are impossible. How, for example, in chapter four, can a rainbow be like an emerald? Rainbows are multicolored, emeralds are green. So how, how does yeah. that work? How, how does suddenly an alt, uh, you've got the vision around the throne and suddenly you see an altar appear. We didn't know that. And then suddenly there's a, there's a doors and there's suddenly, so actually when you, when you actually trace through his visionary descriptions, they don't actually make sense they're not actually physically possible and that's why when people try and do artistic renditions they they really struggle but what what john has given us is not a vision he's given us a vision report in fact he hasn't even given mm -hmm. us a vision report i did a quick sum the other day when i was in a conference and board and i separated the text out 43 percent of what john writes is what he hears not what he sees yeah people don't feel like that yeah so it's actually an audition as much as it is a vision and when you when he when he records what he hears i'd say well okay that that's that's something given which he may or not may be crafting but when he describes what he sees he's clearly crafting and the whole text itself is crafted and at the end he emphasizes the textual nature of this you know it's almost as if jesus picks up the pen like paul does in his letters and, and from the amanuensis and says I, Jesus, am writing this. And then, then John takes back the pen and says, well, I've testified to this. Yeah. In other words, it, it focuses on the nature of this text as a text. And that's what we should pay attention to. That's so um, interesting. That's so interesting. And I think the, like the notion there that when you look at the literary creation that comes out of it, there is hmm. such meaning in the numbers and the word orders yeah. that's there yeah. to be unlocked. And uh, a real desire that people engage it in depth and carefully to do yeah. that, not just haphazardly stick at it. Uh, I mean, one question that I'm getting a lot, I mean, as we're reading through the news, it's it's pretty con it's concerning globally at the moment. I mean, mm. we're here in Australia yeah. had fires, then into floods, then into the pandemic, yeah. and then floods and fires again. And so we, yeah. we're just going through a range of natural disasters. And you're seeing that play out mm. in other ways with big tidal mm. waves and big famines and sickness. And, mm. and so there's a lot of people asking. These look very apocalyptic in terms of what's happening around yeah. the world, uh, potential re kicking off of the kind of Cold War with what's happening in the Ukraine and uh, with mm. the Russia. Mm. And so... Mm. You've got in the book of Revelation uh, these bowls and trumpets and seeming judgments and plagues and famines and natural disasters and wars and rumors mm. of wars. And mm. it's got people mm. thinking, and is there something mm. end times going on here? And mm. in light of, I guess, the, the global anxiety and even for Christians, the anxiety that can come along with what's going on in the world. How should the book of Revelation function? Uh, there are those, like you said, that see these things, they dive in, they think, all right, I'm going to find what's happening here in the newspaper and in the text in chapter 14, uh, and others who react and say, that's exactly what you're not meant to do, so I'm going to ignore Revelation. Is there a message of Revelation for a world that is packed with a ton of uncertainty right now? Yeah. Well, um, we need a bit of historical perspective here. So when um, in the Thirty Years' War in, in, the, in what we now call Germany, in the Holy, Holy Roman Empire, uh, it was such a devastating time that in parts of Germany, 70% of the population died. Uh, in the the Black Death, and going back a bit, wow. bit, bit, back in the 14th century, something like 50% of the population of Europe died. Wow. Uh, in the plague of Justinian in the, ooh, where am I, 6th century, uh, it was so devastating. It was probably a thing that brought the Roman Empire to an end. Um, what other examples? Genghis Khan. When Genghis Khan swept across with his Mongol hordes into Europe, he, he slaughtered so many people that so much farmland went back to forest, you can actually measure in ice cores from the, from the Antarctic the change in the oxygen level in the atmosphere. Wow. So when people point out that, a third of the population of Australia has been massacred or slaughtered. Then I, I then I'll begin to take that more, that claim a little bit more seriously. Yeah. And again, it illustrates the fact that we just see our world in apocalyptic terms. Now that means again that connects through to the thing we said about Revelation being written to people in the first century. So, so when 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 people living in first century Smyrna when they read. Um, 
um, John saying about the four horsemen coming, and one was about conquest from the east, another was about famine, another was about slaughter and disaster, another was about death. Their response would have been, yes, John, that is the world we live in. This is an uncertain world. You know, Roman cities were so densely populated. You know, the average Roman city was four times as densely populated per square mile as uh, modern day Manhattan. Because of they built they built these buildings, and they divided and a whole family who lives in rooms. When when there was a fire, then whole cities would be devastated and everyone would die. When there was a plague, the plague would sweep through and and just it would because they were so densely packed, you would never escape from plagues. People used to flee the cities. Interestingly, Christians stayed in the cities. Uh, pagans tended to flee, and because of that, Christians had a greater greater survival rate from plagues because they were cared for by their relatives. Just mm. as a matter, and that led to church growth instantly. Wow. Um, so so this is the world. This is the world they knew. And this is the world, and this is all through history. This is the kind of crisis we people have faced, and that's why they've they've reached for the Book of Revelation as crisis literature to try and make sense of it. But it also gives us another insight into Revelation, which is that it paints these pictures so vividly. So I just see uh, all the time, every year, I see uh, another redrawing of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And again, this is why the text is so powerful because it, it describes this aspect of life so vividly. And one of the things that's fascinating about the text is that when you put together these images with the numerology what you've got is on the one hand this text is chaos and it depicts a chaotic world but on the other hand it does it in an incredibly ordered way it, it it's the chaos of the world is contained in an ordered discipline one of the writers i love on this is craig kirster and he says it's a little bit like the numerology and the structure is like a relentless steady drumbeat but within that the tune played is chaotic and this gives us an immediate insight into what revelation is doing for us what it's saying is that you look at the world around you you look at your own life this may look like absolute chaos and, and, and personal chaos and personal disaster or national disaster whatever it is but but the sovereignty of god uh, gives a steady rhythm and a, and a structured container to hold this. So it's not that the four, four horsemen are just unleashed and unleashed chaos. It's that they only do that at the command of the lamb who's on the throne. So it's actually, when you, when you want to make sense of the chaos in the world around you, if you want to know the answer to that, the answer is found in the sovereignty of God, of, in, in the person of Jesus who experienced this personal chaos himself, but has overcome it because he's the lamb who was slain but is now standing so if you're experiencing tribulation suffering whatever then this is the one you look to because he's the one who will bring resurrection life into your chaos and disorder that's cool i, I like that sense that image that you gave of the drum beat even mm. if the tune is chaotic <laughs> like that's yeah. a that's such a helpful image um and i think for a lot of people that shift between what's happening in the earthly scenes in the book of revelation and then all of a sudden up to a heavenly scene and just yeah. having that comfort that there is a bigger vision yeah. that things aren't and, and the, throne, the central image yeah the central image in the book is the throne mm. so you know you look to the chaos of the world then you look back to god is on his throne and yeah. and ultimately our ultimate hope is not that you know, after a particular sort of chronolo chronology is going to happen. Our ultimate hope is that whatever is in the foreground of your particular situation, personally or historically, the ultimate view, vision is that the throne of God will come from heaven to earth and actually that God's sovereignty and his peace and his order will be known one day. And that's the hope we, we fix our eyes on. Oh, so helpful. Uh, I want you to help me out with another question that's mm. specific in this area. So some of the images in the book of Revelation almost get viral status and one of those is this idea of the mark of the beast and during covid i got this question repeatedly whether in public q a's it was coming in through our website or on our socials yeah, yeah, because yeah. the vaccine was spread oh, various vaccines right throughout the world and then vaccine mandates were put in place in different countries as a requirement yeah. to be able to keep your job or to do trade yeah. or a whole yeah. range of different activities and so the question effectively i kept getting is the covid vaccine the mark of the beast and I would love it if someone who spent a lot of time wrestling through this book as a whole says, what is the mark of the beast? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the answer is, I, I want to say again, yes and no. <laughs> Don't make it more complicated. Um, is, is, is Revelation 13 predicting an event happening 2,000 years in the future? Answer, no. Because... 
this is a letter. This was written to particular people in a particular time, particular place in the first century. The idea that people have read this and, has gone, and have gone, you know, John's readers will receive this and goes, well, this makes no sense to us because it's clearly written about 2,000 years in the future. So I'll tell you what, let's tuck it in our Bibles anyway, just in case. I mean, that's just ridiculous. It's an, it's an absurd idea. It meant something to John and it meant something to them. Now, in terms of the text, there's really no doubt, there's a massive consensus of scholarship, um, which is that the number 666 uh, is a reference to Roman imperial power in the form of the Emperor Nero. And the reason we can be really confident about that is because this is one of the four ways in which um, John uses numbers in the book of Revelation. If you, he says to, he says that the number is the number of a beast, but it's also the number of a man's name. Now, this is this is called isopsephism, which is iso just means the same as in isobars are a, a connection, the same pressure in the weather forecast. So it's it's taking two things and it's identifying them by identifying the, their numbers. And this again forces us to read Revelation in its first century cultural context. We think of numbers as kind of abstract ideas. In the first century, numbers were tangible things. Uh, you you didn't have. 10, you had 10 pebbles or 10 apples or 10 pears or 10 whatever it was. So we need to just recognize these are very specific, tangible things. So when you take the, the word beast in Greek and you read it, write it in Hebrew letters, and then you add up the value of the letters. You see, they didn't have a separate number system, so they used letters for numbers. So a bit like the Romans used I, 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 V, and so on. They didn't have an Arabic number sure. system that we had. That was, that was several centuries later. So in Greek and in Hebrew, every letter has a number therefore every word has a value and the word the value of the word beast written in hebrew letters adds up to 666 you can do the math i've got done it in the in my grow booklet there i actually do it on the page and i do it in the commentary as well and if you take the phrase nero caesar and you write that in greek in that greek phrase in hebrew letters you also get the number 666 so what sure. what john is doing is he's identifying the beast with uh, the Emperor Nero. Now, the reason, and, and, and John's first readers would have said, well, we know that, John. Yeah, we, of course we know that 666. We don't understand this. We find this this kind of thing happening all over the ancient world. If you go to, if you go to the ruins of Pompeii and Herculaneum today, you will find inscriptions on the wall which use exactly this kind of numerology. It was really common in the ancient world. So yeah, well. we find it hard just because of that cultural distance from, from the text. But the, the key message that John is giving is saying, look, you've, you, you live in a world where there's a cultural system which says, look to us for safety and salvation. Look to us for peace and prosperity. Now, that system was Roman imperial power. And John is saying that human domination system is, is illusory. It's deluding you because the one who gives you peace and prosperity is not the Emperor Nero. It's Jesus Christ. And of course, it was Roman power which executed Jesus. So it's not just that this imperial system is 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 wrong or is a mistake or, you know, you're going to get your you're, you're, you're choosing. You're back in the wrong horse there. It's actually opposed violently to the people of God. So yeah. the question for us when reading that text is where do we see such human domination systems today? Now, depending on when and where you lived, you'd find different things. So for Luther, that human domination system opposed to the purposes of God was actually the Roman Catholic Church. So you'll find in the Luther's Bible, you'll find the woman riding the beast is wearing a papal tiara. If you lived in Saddam Hussein's Iran, Iraq, you might have seen the human domination system, the totalitarianism of Saddam Hussein. If you were a Christian living in communist, uh, the Soviet era, which, which incidentally lasted for about 70 years, which is interesting um, in view of Jeremiah's prophecy, but you might have seen Soviet um, communism as the beast. So the question for, for those of us living in the West is what is, the, what, is this, what is this cultural system which demands our loyalty, which won't truck any questions, which, which promises peace and prosperity to us, but which is actually opposed to the purposes of God. Now, there are various different answers to that. And, and one of them, I've got a book on my shelf here, which argues that the claims of global capital do that. So it, it, people say, well, if you want to be happy, buy the right trainers, wear the right baseball cap, wear, wear the right clothes. That's the, that's what, or, or, or appear well on Instagram, get lots of Instagram followers. That's the way to, that's the way to do it. Or it, you might want to say, well, you know, all the stuff about um, gender, uh, gender identity ideology. Uh, only look inside and discover your true identity. That's the path to peace and prosperity. And in all these things, we're called to say, well, well, actually, how does that match up to the claims of Jesus? What does it mean to say in that context? Actually, it's Jesus who's Lord, not 
consumerism which is lord or or, or you know communism which is lord or gender identity politics which is lord yeah. so it really is a question of saying who who is lord and, and what what the book of revelation is doing in its context and therefore what it does for us it's raising the stakes and, it, and and what john is saying to his readers is you can't just sit comfortably with these two different systems because in the end they ultimately challenge your loyalty well jesus mm. said the same thing didn't he? he said you can't serve two masters you can't worship both god and mammon um you, mm. because these things are all spiritual forces so so it, the whole language of 666 is saying you cannot be obedient to two masters you're going to have to make a decision now here's the argument here's the question in with covid and all that were were governments there's a question about the medicine my wife's a doctor a gp so i i had the covid vaccine of course i did because i i want i wanted to not suffer from covid and it's a serious serious disease one of the questions though alongside that is did western governments overreach in a kind of totalitarian Italian way in in demanding lockdowns and demanding we did this and i think there's a legitimate question to ask there you don't have to be a covid denier to recognize you know some serious losses of freedom there on the other hand let's not make autonomous personal independent freedom our god either mm. uh you know the gospel calls us into community communitarian relationships responsible communities looking after one another so there are some important questions to ask there but we need to recognize that Revelation 13, 18 is not about the COVID vaccine in that kind of direct sense. Again, we have to yeah. do this, this, this journey around and say, what was John saying to his readers and how then does that speak the gospel into our context? That was, sorry, quite a long answer. Helpful. Helpful. No, but that's, hu that's hugely helpful in terms of a, a way of reading so many of these images to relate yeah. to their first century world, but then to ask similar broad questions. How is that prophetically speaking somewhat to our context yeah. as well? And there are different ways, obviously, of reading the book of Revelation as your commentary spells out. You know, People fall into different camps of, do the majority of events that are meant to describe real world happenings, did that take mm. place prior to AD 70 and the destruction of the Jerusalem, sort of the Yep. The strong preterist view, you've got the idealist view, which is looking at more of a way of reading all of spiritual history. You've got the futurist view, which is saying, no, most of the predictive content from chapter four onwards is talking about some future events. Mm. But uh, mm. irrespective, everyone is somewhat united that that does spell out God's end game at the end of the book of Revelation, where everything is ultimately yep. going uh, in the last, last few chapters of Christ's yep. return and of the ushering in of a new kingdom and a final judgment yep. and stuff. Uh, yeah. One message that I think strikes me is um, this notion of understanding your end game of what the future yeah. really will be like, what God's working it yeah. all towards. Yeah. How important do you think that final vision that Revelation gives to us is for both understanding the rest of the Christian story as well as maybe just if someone's not a, a Christian thinking this today, to mm. really wrestle with that mm. vision mm. for how to live their life now? Oh, I think it's absolutely hugely important. And, and the reason for that is that yes we are in the end times and we've been in the end times for the last 2000 years uh it that, that and that and the new testament makes that really clear it is i mean i've got another great book that i've written on on that whole question of the kingdom of god and eschatology in the end times and all that kind of thing and um it's really pretty striking that uh in in um, acts 2 at pentecost when all this stuff is going on and you've got this, the, the, the spirit coming down in, in the sort of appearance of flames of fire and you've got sound of rushing wind and then and, and everyone's speaking in these different multiple different languages. And, and, and the responses uh, of, the, of the crowd is, what on earth is going on here? How do we make, se how do we make sense of this chaos? <laughs> and when Peter stands up, he's really clear. He says, and he actually takes a comment from Joel 2.32 and he actually slightly adapts it. And he says, this, you see, is that about which the prophet Joel wrote, and he, he starts mm -hmm. the quotation this way, in the end times, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So the, the, the Jesus' resurrection from the dead was a sign that, that, that history has come to an end, because for, for any first century Jew, the resurrection of the dead is a thing that's going to happen at the end of the ages. So this, this old age is already coming to an end. This age of sin and disruption where God's people are persecuted and under trouble and oppressed and not not and the temple worship is corrupted. This old age is coming to an end in Jesus's ministry. And the new age, the age to come, is already breaking into the present with the poor outpouring of the Spirit. And one of the visions for the end times, Isaiah 2 says very clearly, in the last days, 
Zion will be the greatest mountain lifted up and all the nations will be drawn to Zion, to, to the temple presence of God. And so, but now this end times temple is Jesus. And Paul says, we are, if we're incorporating Jesus, we are that end times temple and we are being lifted up and all the nations are being drawn to us. This is the vision of Revelation, Revelation 7 verse 9. People from every tribe and nation and language and people are coming into this new end times Israel of God. So we have been in the end times for 2000 years, mm. but this old age has not yet fallen away. So we are all living in the overlap of the ages. On the one hand, we have one foot, as it were, in this age, and we have one foot in the age to come. And, and you know, the message of the whole of the New Testament in Jesus with Paul in Revelation is to say, we need to live our reality. We need to live this new resurrection life. You know, Paul, this is even behind Paul's language of baptism in Romans chapter six. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, when you're baptized, you die. Your old life dies because you no longer are really controlled by the powers of this age. You're, you die in the water, but then you come up out of the water and that's new life. That's resurrection life. So, we're, so we are already starting to live the life of the age to come. And, and that's why, but right at the very beginning of, of this apocalyptic prophetic letter um, in, in that John says to the, his readers, I, this is Revelation 1 verse 9, I, John, am your brother, your fellow traveler in, in what? In tribulation, so tribulation has already started, tribulation and in kingdom and in patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. So if you follow Jesus, you will expect tribulation, you will experience tribulation. Well, that's what Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, in this world you will have trouble, but I've overcome the world. You will also experience the wonders of the kingdom. Now, how do you live uh, in that kind of double view? How do you live on the one hand in the wonders of the kingdom and what God has done for us in Jesus, but on the other hand in the tribulation we're all gonna have if we follow Jesus faithfully? And the answer is we need this quality of patient endurance. And again, this is the heart of the gospel. In Luke's account of the parable of the sower, where Jesus says, you know, some seed fell on the, on the path, some seed fell on the rocky yeah. ground, some seed fell amongst the weeds. Some fell on the good soil and they produced a harvest, 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold with patient endurance isn't that fascinating the same word there because and paul in his missionary journey in acts 14 says through much tribulation we must enter the kingdom of god he's you know you might put up a sign up outside your church saying hey you want to know what suffering's like come and hear dan patterson preaching um and you sorry no it's not, not far possible. off not far off <laughs> But you see, this is the Christian life. Until Jesus comes again, we both know the joy of his grace and his love and the security that he gives us on the one hand. On the other hand, we know the challenges of living in a world which is walking to a different drumbeat uh, mm. and, and, and where we, we are going to experience trouble and tribulation. But we've set our hope on the vision of the world to come and we begin to live that out in our lives uh, and with patient endurance. And that's what Jesus calls us to. We need to, we, we, we need to man up. <laughs> live as future people now. I like that. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah. leaning into that notion of him coming back. I mean, this has been a big part of my own personal story. I did my master's thesis somewhat on the, on the doctrine of judgments. Right. And yeah. certainly our culture is packed with misconceptions around these yeah. themes of what's going to happen when Jesus returns. So how do you feel like the book mm -hmm. of Revelation speaks into popular conceptions and maybe undermines them when it comes to ideas like heaven and hell? Well, the, the major thing it says is that is that our destiny is not to leave our bodies and go to be with God in heaven. It is, again, consistent with the rest of the New Testament. The future hope is that the new Jerusalem, the heavenly presence, temple presence of God, fully comes down to earth. So that's what we're looking forward to. And again, in Revelation 5, it says, you know, that those who've been purchased by his blood from every tribe, language, people, and nation, uh, and they will reign with him on earth forever. Yeah. So our, our hope is a renewed heaven and earth, a renewed creation, uh, it, which has been perfected and, and, uh, and brought back to God's original plan, but it, but in, in a much better way, because actually when you restore that which is broken, it actually becomes even better than the thing it was at the very beginning. Um, mm -hmm. People get really hung up on the whole thing about the millennium and all the different visions on the great white throne, and, and this is from Revelation 19 to 21. And again, very often we make the mistake of reading um, reading a, a sequence of visions as if it was a vision of sequences. So when he says, and I saw, and I saw, and I saw, too, too often ordinary readers think, oh, well, he sees one thing and then he sees another thing. Therefore, he's seeing a sequence of events. But that's never true in the book of Revelation. I don't think the sequence of the seven seals and the sequence of the seven trumpets follow one on from another. They're actually a retelling of the same thing, but doing drawing out different things. And I think that the yeah. actually when you count through from Revelation 19 to Revelation 21, you get a sequence of seven visions. And I think what John is doing us is telling us 
seven dimensions of what it means when Jesus returns. So on the one hand, it's a victory over the forces of evil. On the other hand, it's a judgment before the great white throne. On the other hand, it's a destruction of the forces of evil, the vision of the, the uh, lake of fire. On the other hand, it's the final judgment, the final consignment of Satan. On the other hand, it's this wonderful vision of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven to earth. And, and this is fantastic because the the space this cubic space of the new jerusalem in in scripture a cube always signifies the holy presence of god in 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 kings when the um one king is it one king six i think whether the the the, the temple is des- is described as solomon's going to mm-hmm. build it and the holy of holies is a cube it's 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits so this always signifies the holy presence of god that's why john uses cube numbers 144,000 to describe the people of god because we are god's temple presence space holy and presence in the world and this this enormous this giant cube will descend which on the one hand is the space it, it occupies the whole of the known world the roman empire and and so this is the time revelation 11 when the kingdom of our world has become the kingdom of his of our god and his christ and this space is both the space occupied by the presence of God and it's the space occupied by the people of God. So in other words, God is just so close to us. We are almost the space that we occupy is coterminous with him. And that's why John says uh, that he, he can, he's so close to us, he can reach out and his finger will wipe away every tear from our eye because there'll be no more suffering or pain. So this is an extraordinary vision of the people of God and God himself and the, the Lamb and the Spirit sort of just in such a close union together that, mm. that we find the, all the answers to our loneliness and our frustration, and our angst and our, and our anxiety about the world. And, and that's, that's what we're looking forward to. And that is what we get a foretaste of now. Yeah, I did, I did a wedding just this last weekend and that imagery of a cosmic marriage between heaven and earth yeah. where God and our space will come together. And I just, I, yeah. It's amazing. Like it really is mm. captivating both for the imagination to try and ponder mm. what would that be like, mm. but also mm. just for your life's direction, wanting to mm. lean towards something that is supremely good and preparing mm. for that now to live as a, like you said, sort of a foretaste or a, a trailer for that coming feature yeah. film now um, yeah. in, in yeah. order to invite others to join as well. So that's, that's really yeah. cool. It's really cool. And I think the invitation to join is always there, all the way through, even though Revelation is full of images of judgment. Alongside that, there's always language of invitation. And almost mm-hmm. the last words we find in the text are that, on the one hand, nothing impure, nothing unholy will come through the gates, and yet the gates are open day and night. Mm-hmm. And, and, and John's final plea is to say, come and drink from the free gift of the river of the water of life. Leave behind your unholiness. Leave behind your insecurity and anxiety. Come mm-hmm. and freely drink. It's a free gift. It's a costly gift because it, because we have to leave behind those things we're attached to. But the gift itself is free, and the invitation is for everyone to come and to drink. I love that part at the end of Revelation, that invitation to come. We, we tried to mimic that somewhat in the book that uh, my friends and I feebly wrote, but just that invitational element when you get to the celebration of what God does in, in that ultimate yeah. end picture. Uh, without playing favorites then, what would be maybe your favorite part of the book of Revelation? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask me this. And uh, my first answer is to say, uh, you can't take one part because the whole text is so integrated. You have to read every part in relation to every other. Having said but. that, <laughs> but, <laughs> the part that I keep going back to and through which God has spoken to me again and again and again is actually chapter seven. Mm. I'm hoping one day to write a book on this, uh, maybe in the next couple of years. Uh, and the, the, reason, the reason for that is that you get, again, typically in Revelation, you get a sequence and then you get an interruption. So, uh, so John is always like saying, I'm going to set you up to do this, but ha, don't do it in the end. You know, I've got, you think I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oop, no, I'm going to take a deviation. So in, in, in chapter six, you have the opening of the uh, six of the seven seals. And then before the end comes, you have, you had the questions asked, the, the, the saints under the altar going, you know, how long, O oh Lord? What are you going to do? What's your answer to this chaotic world? And then you get the beginnings of an answer, and that's chapter 7. And that is that God is, this, this chapter 7 is basically about who the people of God are. In, in, the, light, in the light of the way the world is, and the, in the light of the way of what God has done. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's an extraordinary, it's a multidimensional picture, but it, it, it's, it's firstly, you draw out three main things from it. Firstly, it's a picture of 
God's people as a disciplined spiritual army focused on the holy worship of the holy God. That's what the 144,000 is about. The second thing is it's a people suffering where, you know, uh, he hears the 144,000 not counted, then he turns to see who they are, and it turns out they're uncountable, which is a lovely paradox in Revelation. These counted people are uncountable, and these, these Israelites from the 12 tribes are actually from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And John turns to one of the elders and says, who are these? And, and uh, uh, the elder asks him, who are these? And he says, you know. And he says, these are the ones who've washed their robes, who've come through great tribulation and washed their robes white in the, in the blood of the Lamb. So this paradox that, that it's in Jesus that we stand in the face of suffering and that we, we, we are made holy in, in a sinful world. And then the third image is, is this, this hymnic bit. So you have the saints praising. And they, pray, they praise God. Yes, they do praise God for what he's done, and they do praise God for what he's doing, but their main focus of their praise is on what God will do, how he will bring this world to an end, and how he will be with his people forever. And and it anticipates, it literally anticipates in the words of Revelation 21. And that, for me, is, is who we are as a, the people of God. We are, Jesus calls us to a disciplined life of holy worship. Jesus calls us to walk with him in suffering. This is what Paul says in Philippians 3, that I may, I may you know, know, know his sufferings, be like mm -hmm. him in his death. But that in that we are sustained by this vision of praise for the future, that the best is yet to be, and that God calls us into this wonderful future where there will be no more suffering and pain. That's my favorite chapter. I can tell why that's your favorite. That's a great <laughs> chapter. Um, yeah. Well, just kind of drawing this up to, to a close then, uh, Revelation ultimately is all about Jesus. I mean, you shared before the very first verse, yeah. the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave yeah. to him to show his servants the things that must take place. Uh, yeah. And I, I love that. It's, a, it's an unveiling of who Jesus really yeah. is. It's an unveiling of dimensions of who he is that were previously not yet seen or understood by his mm. people. Uh, mm. What is it that as John is sitting there having whatever experience he has on Patmos and relates this then through Revelation, what is it about Jesus that most draws you in? I think it's the extraordinary paradox that here is someone with who looks like the most extraordinary expression of divine power in that first vision where his eyes are blazing and his <laughs> legs are like bronze and his, I mean, just this extraordinary constellation of overwhelming images and power. And, and yet, He's the lamb who's offered himself as a sacrifice for us. So I, for me, it's that extraordinary holding together of Jesus' power and might on the one hand and his vulnerability and suffering on the other. Um, and there's just two other things that are reminding me and confirm this for me. One is that um, for those who are following the the, the sort of pattern of readings around the churches, the lectionary, uh, this Sunday we're looking at the transfiguration. And then you have the the, the person of Jesus and they go up a mountain with the three disciples, and they suddenly see who he really is. He's just, he's, he's just, he's just radiant with light. Matthew's account makes it really clear. He, he, he's just shining with the light of the awesome presence of God, the person of God. This is, mm -hmm. this is God in the flesh. And yet then this vision passes, and, and then they just see Jesus hungry, thirsty, tired, uh, vulnerable, just like them. Yeah. And I think the other the other verse which I was just so struck by is one of the things I do is I just use a, um, a daily dose of Greek where you get a, a Greek verse each day and you get a little video by Rob Plummer in the States. And a couple of days ago, we read uh, John 19, verse 2. And it says, and it's uh, it's it's the, the Jesus being taken after his trial and being taken to crucifixion. And it just says, and, and reading the Greek text really helps you slow down and focus on this. And it says that the soldiers woe for him a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and they placed round him a purple cloak and i just find myself really kind of choking up with that it was amazing which is that the the purple robe signified who jesus really was he is the lord of lords he is the king of kings he is the almighty one uh, he is the one with all power and all might and paul says one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that jesus is lord and yet they twisted the thorns into a crown and pressed it into his head so so that his his he, he was bloody and bleeding and wounded from that and what that image just i was just so struck by the fact that you can't wear the, the purple robe unless you wear the crown of thorns mm. 
Jesus did not take his throne until he was crucified and died and buried and then was raised again. And this is the one, who, and, and he did it because he loves us. He suffered for us. He suffered to take our sins and to redeem us. And But it's only through that that he then takes his throne. So the one who reigns for us is the one who has suffered with us. Uh, and the one who brings us healing is the one who has borne our wounds. And I, I just think that is... Uh, that is awesome. I, 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 I struggle to understand, but I just stand in awe that, that this, this Jesus who reigns for us is the one who suffered for us. Yeah, me too. The, that picture captivates, doesn't it? Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ian, thanks so much for just being willing to chat about the book of Revelation. I know you love it. You've written books on it and uh, really, really benefited <laughs> from reading the stuff that you've done. If people want to go and either find your books or get in touch with your blog, where's the best place they can go? Yeah, just go to the blog at safidzo.com. Uh, it's difficult to spell, so the easiest thing is whatever search engine you use, just type in, type in Ian Paul blog and you'll find me. There is another Ian Paul who writes a blog, but he lives in Israel and he writes about computers. So if you get to that one, it's the wrong one. <laughs> uh, but you'll find it. The, and, is, uh, right. the Israel thing might throw people for a moment, but that's... It might have been, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, and I've never, I've never been in touch with him. I ought to really. But, uh, yeah. but, but on my homepage, you'll just find links to where you can find all, all my texts. So they're, they're easy Great. to find. Well, thanks so much for coming on the channel, Ian. Really appreciate it. Great to be with you, Dan. Right. Take care. No worries. Well, if you've loved this episode, then please do subscribe both on YouTube and then jump over to social media as well at QC Socials and make sure you subscribe. We're putting out new content, not just long form conversations, but shorter responses to big questions that people are asking that we really do hope are helpful to you. If you want to get in touch or ask any questions or suggestions for future episodes, uh, find us at questioningchristianity.com. But it's been great and we'll see you next time. Dan here from Questioning Christianity. Thanks so much for checking us out. We are all about helping you connect the Christian story to life's deepest questions. So if you're enjoying the content, make sure you subscribe and click the bell on YouTube and then go ahead and follow us on socials.